Good evening, and welcome to a reading of my previously published work, The Queen of Serpents, the Serpentine Figure of the Indo-European Earth Mother. This piece, as it happens, partially goes out to one of my particular devotees. Begins. As we have often noted, the prevalent mythic perception of the serpent amidst the minds of many is that of a demonic antagonist, and a male one at that. There are solid reasons for this, of course. Foremost among these is the Judeo-Christian baseline many of us tend to operate under, where a certain serpent is indeed symbolic of the arch-enemy, right from the Garden of Eden through to the end of days, and within the realms of the Indo-European mythology more endogenously, we have the incredibly prominent figure of the demon dragon in the waters, Vritra, Jormungandr, and others besides. It would be tempting, therefore, to relegate the role of the serpent in our ancestral beliefs to that of the adversary, as something to be overcome, and certainly Vritra as obstacle is a not entirely inappropriate translation. And yet, the truth is, as we so frequently find, much more complicated, complex, and nuanced than all of that. In previous pieces, I have taken a look at the underlying serpentine conceptry for the Indo-European Skyfather Deific, with each of Odin, Zeus, and Rudra having a serpentine form and associated characteristics turning up in the relevant mythic conceptual syllabary. Uh, consider, for instance, the well-quoted lines of the Rigsthula, describing one of the essentialized characteristics of the young Jarl, Otulavaru Augusem Irmlingi, which I probably mispronounced egregiously, apologies to the Icelandic people in the audience, the translation of which means flashing his eyes like a young dragon's shone, reflected also in the eyes of the Dracon of Greece. It's also where we get draconic in the sense of a rather harsh leader. However, now it is the Skyfather's consort who turns our attention, and I would go so far as to say that here, the serpentine skin fits even better, and also helps to illuminate, via her silken coils, several other vitally important nexes of the ancient Indo-European mythic view of the world. The linkages are, appropriately enough, three. The serpentine form of the Earth Mother, as connoting earth and fertility. The serpentine form of the Earth Mother, as reflecting the waters, the shape of rivers wending their way across the earth or encircling about the edges of all. The serpentine form of the Earth Mother as the venomous avenger, the enraged aspect of nature's draconic wrath made manifest, and encircling also to protect. Although it should be noted that this last one also blends quite heavily into the regal element of the goddess as queen, Appropriate, it would have to be said, given one of the prime roles and duties of a ruler, is the facility to protect, to police, to uphold order, and to defend. And whilst it would be easy enough to approach all of this in a mere abstract, it is rather more handy to be able to affix all of these concepts to tangible, actual examples from the scriptural canon of our forebears. We shall start with the most basic and direct of these, and work our way up to the more complex conceptry from there. The Serpents of Demeter So to begin, Demeter, a rather archetypal Earth Mother deific, although with some conjecture as to the etymology of her chiefly encountered theonym. Some propose a Gi, as in Gaia Mother, understanding, others go with the Mother of the Grain, as its root. I have another theory based around D in a more celestial orientation, but more upon that perhaps some other time. This figure is also one that is most strongly serpent associated. Within the mythology, there is a rather prominent occurrence wherein Zeus has a sexual engagement with Demeter in serpentine form, or perhaps it is with Persephone, or with Rhea. 
The texts themselves are multifarious upon this matter, although we can be generally sure that it is the same encounter, as various of these make pointed mention of the same progeny, that being Dionysus, resulting. And in any case, as I have long argued, each of these three, Demeter, Persephone, and Rhea, are in fact one. Hence the ongoing cavalcade of coterminities within their relevant localized mythologies. It should be noted that various of these recountings have Persephone as the resulting child, which is interesting on grounds that, as we have previously demonstrated, Dionysus to himself be the sky father also. Perhaps it is apt that the other Greco-Roman figure begotten in such a manner be likewise a projection or an emanation or an echo of the other parent involved. Yet the more immediately visually apparent serpentine associations of Demeter are iconographic. There is an enormous weight of both scriptural and archaeologic material showing such a linkage, including Demeter having a serpent-wreathed head in statuary or grasping a serpent along with a dove and a dolphin, symbolizing her dominion over the three realms, earth, air, and sea or, for that matter, with a pair of winged serpents drawing her chariot, or with a serpent named Cacerides as her attendant, and so on and so forth. It is little wonder that the serpent is recorded to be a sacred animal of Demeter in that light. However, this does not in and of itself sufficiently answer the question as to why the serpent would be so closely linked to the Earth Mother Deific. The most immediately plausible explication we can advance is also an incomplete one, namely that the serpent is quite low to the ground, in fact lives in the ground and is a power in that natural realm. It is a fine basis, but it does not really fully ring true, as there is little meaning to it, it is the mere association of environs. My personal supposition is that the serpent is sacred to Demeter also due to the grain mother element to her. For what we find in various of the Greek and other Indo-European terms pertaining to the growth of the grain and other such green shoots of plant life emblematic of fertility are terms that also occur around various snakes, a Proto-Indo-European ger and ker, in relation to the serpentine ker crops or the mysterious figures of the horned serpent and the horned god. The notion of these crops growing up through the ground like horns, or if you prefer spear shafts, as see if the warriors growing from the serpent's teeth shown by Cadmus into Aelia, is well preserved in our etymologies. And it is not hard to see how the figurative view of these being as akin to tiny serpents poking up through the ground may also have occurred. To bring this back to where we began the section upon Demeter, it would make also a conceptual sense for the fertility of the earth to be correlate, not only with the earth mother deific, but also with a certain creative input. To match this from the sky father, something that is preserved in the Greek mythos with the pairing of Zeus and Demeter in serpentine form begetting Dionysus or Persephone, both of whom are quite strongly keyed to new life and the rendering of what was once barren, instead teeming with abundance which invites a perhaps obvious question. Can we find this perception expressed anywhere else amidst the archaic Indo-European canons of religion? I think by now you already know the answer to that. Sarpa Rajni, the serpent queen of the Vedas. To quote from the Shatapada Brahmana, one of the uh, commentary or ritual manual texts that occur as part of the Vedas, dating to the early years of the first millennium BC in terms of their compiling, yet which I have earlier demonstrated to contain elements that must be far older and Arakan right back to the Urhimat. The particular section, for those of you who wish to check my referencing, being 214, 29 to 30. 29. He stands worshipping by the fire, while muttering the three Rig verses of the Queen of Serpents, those being found in Rig Veda Mandala 10, 189. 1. Hither has come that spotted bull, 
and has settled down before the mother, and before the father on going up to heaven. She moves along through the luminous spheres, breathing forth from his breath. The mighty bull has illumined the sky. He rules over the thirty domains, and song is bestowed on the winged one, the sun, yea, with the light at the break of day. Thus he recites, and whatever benefit has not been obtained by him, either through the equipments, or through the asterisms, or through the seasons, or through the laying down of the fire, all that is thereby obtained by him. And for this reason, he stands worshipping by the fire, while muttering the verses of the Queen of Serpents. Verse 30. They say, however, that one need not stand by the fire, worshipping with the verses of the Queen of the Serpents. For the Queen of Serpents, they argue, is this earth. And accordingly, when he lays down the fire on her, he thereby obtains all his desires. Hence, he need not stand by the fire, worshipping with the verses of the Queen of Serpents. End quote. We know from various other Vedic hymnals that Dios Paradyanya, the aforementioned father, iconographically identified as a bull, brings forth the fertility of the earth, the mother, via rain, and other such mechanisms that encourage the plants to grow, or in this particular case, the sun in the sky. This is, after all, exactly what is also meant by Dios, Zeus, etc., the bright solar sky. So what we see above in this section of Vedic ritual manual should be utterly unsurprising. The earth, identified with this queen of serpents, encounters the sky father as bull, and prosperity and abundance thus the results. This is spelled out in more lurid detail in the Aitareya Brahmana. V23, 24-4. They creep thence. They go to the Sadas. The other priests creep out severally according to their want. The Udgatras creep together. They chant to the verses of the Serpent Queen. The Serpent Queen is this earth. For this earth is the queen of what creeps. This earth in the beginning was bare. She saw this spell. The dappled bull hath come. This dappled colour of various forms entered her. Whither she desired, whatever there is here, plants, birds, all forms, entered her. The dappled colour enters him with various forms. Whatever he desires, who knows thus. With mind he utters the prelude. With mind he sings. With mind he responds. With voice he recites. Speech and mind are a pairing of the gods. Verily, thus with a pairing of the gods, they win a pairing. By a pairing of the gods, they are propagated in pairings. Verily, it serves for propagation. He is propagated with offspring and cattle, who knows thus. And further, at 27, 4, Thinking thus, they creep forward together and sing with the verses of the Serpent Queen. The Serpent Queen is this earth, for she is the queen of what creeps. The Serpent Queen is speech, for speech is the queen of what creeps. Moreover, the serpent queen is the cow, for the cow is the queen of what creeps. The spotted bull hath come. This triplet he should not omit to prevent the omission of the strophe. In us place manliness, he says. Manliness is food. End quotes. This further reinforces the conceptual nexus as Vakdevi, the goddess of speech, is the mother of the world, the wife of the sky father. And we are all well familiar with the cow as the symbol of nurture, of nourishment, of natural abundance, and the female counterpart, of course, to the bull. That is, the sky father. The concept tree is also found in the main Vedic texts as well. For example, in the Yajurveda, they sing the verses of the serpent queen on that day. The queen of what creeps is this earth. Whatever on this earth they praise, whatever they have praised, through that is this earth the serpent queen. Yajur Veda 7.3.1 You get the idea. The point is, it would appear that what we find recalled in the ritual formulae and guidance of the Vedas, we find also expressed and encoded 
within the Greek mythology, albeit with some details rendered further symbolic and perhaps twisted with literary license as befits a legendarium rather than a manual of ritual process. However, it is this queen notion which now interests me, as there is another nexus between the various Indo-European mythologia upon this point. The Serpent's Crown The serpent, as we argued in Naga Panchami, a celebration of serpents, has a suite of strong regal connotations for the ancient Indo-European. Recall the serpent crown of Dionysus, or perhaps the not dissimilar serpent-wreathed head of Demeter in some Greek statuary. And this is made abundantly clear in a perhaps surprising source, the Medusa head of the Gorgonaeon device. Now this is an emblem that has been frequently misinterpreted, probably also by the Greeks themselves, as we can tell via the etymology of the name Medusa. The root of this in ancient Greek is medo, meaning to rule, to protect, and with the Proto-Indo-European med, which underpins that, also referring both to counsel and healing, as well as the measuring of boundaries and the imposition of limits. The Gorgonaeon device is borne by both Athena and Zeus, with Athena having incredibly strong cotominity with Vedic Vak, as we have repeatedly demonstrated elsewhere. It is also one of the most prominent emblematic ensigns found upon Greek coinage, because it is actually an insignia of sovereignty, something which it is entirely unsurprising to find in linkage to the Earth Mother Deific, as I have previously covered at great length in previous articles, such as Bharat Mata and the Indo-European Deific of National Identity, which also sets out in further detail various linkages of Athena, with the Indo-European Mountain Queen Deific Complex, a refinement, or if you like, a raising of sorts to the Earth Mother. The spirit of the land, the territory, is quite naturally the regent thereof, something also reflected in the subsequent conceptual understandings of the Fisher King, and related tropes, albeit back to front in that it is a mortal ruler who is correlated there with the land, rather than the land spirit, that rules beyond and above men. And with the spirit, or perhaps we might suggest her attendant, or even descendant after a sort, we also find potential serpentine expression. The ancestral snake Erechtheus, Erechthonius, a figure of uh, interesting parentage, as it happens, involving both Athena and grain-giving, quotes, Gaia, and somewhat co-identified with Poseidon himself in the form of Poseidon Erechtheus, that lived under the Erechtheion, upon the Acropolis of ancient Athens, is an excellent and emblematic exemplar for this genius Loki concept, especially given his protective and paternal associations for the populace thereof, as well as the fact of the Erechtheion being a dual temple to both Athena and Poseidon a Skyfather Deific, as we have previously and extensively covered, uh, prior to 480 BC, and the sack of Athens by the Persians which occurred in that year, which destroyed the site, this locale, the Erechtheion, was said to be inhabited by the spirit of Kekrops, an earth-sparring serpentine forerunner and first king, whom we have already briefly mentioned above, in connection to the Proto-Indo-European mytholinguistic conceptry around the new shoots of growth and grain. Not for nothing do we find so many iconographic depictions of Athena with a serpent beside her, nor the mentions for the serpent is sacred to her and symbolizing the renewable power of life. Although surely the most impressive visual panoply of the Ophidian in question in connection to Athena is the Aegis described by Pindar, while the warlike Aegis of Pallas Athena resoundeth with the hissings of countless serpents. Or by Quintus Smyrnaeus, she, Athena, donned the stormy Aegis, flashing fire, adamantine, massy, a marvel to the gods, whereon was wrought Medusa's ghastly head, 
fearful, strong, serpents breathing forth like the blast of ravening fire, were on the face thereof, crashed on the queen's breast, all the agus links, as after lightning crashes the firmament. Very stirring stuff. Next section. The black avenging form of the serpentine earth mother. We have already established that the Gorgonean represents sovereignty, and in Gora Gorgos Igor, the terrifying face of thunder in Terralia, I demonstrated how this is also recalled the terrifying face of the ruler of the worlds. This terror facing is also relevant for another reason, however, as just as Lord Shiva has a terrific avenger and destroyer form, such as uh, Bharava, Mahakal, or Rudra himself, so too does his wife, the best known example of which being the enraged transformation of Lady Parvati into Kali, the black time death, even of the universe. And most certainly, near anything else within its bounds earlier than that apocalyptically appointed hour of cosmic midnight utter dark. We've been taking a look at this phenomenon amidst the other major instances of our mythologies, in the black avenging form of the Earth Mother, and pursuits of the Sky Father as Solar Horseman, a comparative Indo-European typological evocation series. In particular, the form of Demeter Erinyes, as a black and fear-inducing image of death and decaosune, that is to say, righteousness. It is interesting to note that in the cases of both Kali and Demeter Erinyes, this furious form is described as a skin that is removed once the time for its necessity has passed, perhaps in the manner of a snake sloughing off its skin to be returned to youthful appearance again. The Erinyes are an obvious linkage to Demeter in this form. Indeed, Demeter or Persephone have identification as their mother, and I would say also as their archetype. These are also described as being under the commanding Aegis of Athena. For instance, in Aeschylus's Eumenides, they being eponymous to this ancient tragedy's title. It is again absolutely uncoincidental that the Erinys are described as possessing such strong serpentine features. To quote Nonus Dionysica, Dionysiaca, I should say, he would see the serpentine image of the goddess of Tartaros and Erinys, and leap up scared at the many-coloured vision of the scepter, or Statius's Theobald, Tisiphone, rouses from her infernal abode her companion Megaira, and her kindred snakes to battle. She, murdered into the earth, the name of the absent one, her sister Erinyes, and raised aloft a horned serpent from her hair with her long-drawn hisses. He was the prince of her Caerulean tresses, and straightway, hearing him, earth shuddered and sea and sky. The other heard the sound. By chance she was standing near her sire, Hades. Forthwith she broke through the massive earth, and stood beneath the stars. The manes, the ghosts, rejoice. As the nether darkness grows less thick, so wanes the light above. Her fell sister receives her, and clasps her hand. Stirring stuff. And that is relevant also to the etymology, but more upon that in due course. The conceptry around the Sky Father's consort having a serpentine avenging form of blackest terror is also encountered in more residual form elsewhere within the Indo-European mythic canons. For example, Skadi, a dark and adrastic, that is to say, inescapable as a huntress, a figure married to Odin, delivers the punishment to Loki overseeing the hellish situations and placement, whereby he is bound beneath both earth and a venomous snake spitting venom down into his traitorous face. The confluence of earth and serpent and sanction is clearly visible here, meted out by a shadowy avenger form of the Sky Father's wife. In the Hindu canon, we have the intriguing detail of the Brahmahacha, the personification of the most egregious sin of Brahmanicide. Described as black, horrifying, implacable, female, and often with specifically serpentine visual elements. 
rising up out of the earth and sinking back into the earth when her task is done. The snake that is so often regarded as chaotic, an enemy of law and divine cosmic order, that is to say regarded as demonic, it would appear in actual fact and in female form, is the opposite upon occasion, the upholder of dharma, of rita, of orlog, of dekaosune, and the immanency of this within our universe. Indeed, they are the forces of life, given black terrifying forms that shroud with the imminency of death, in order that they might be protected. In a certain sense, we might fairly state that life is order. That is to say that order finds in-universe expression through force of life, and angry, avenging life is no exception. This is somewhat we should expect, as the etymology of Erinis is plausibly linked to Pai Her, to move and to stir or to stir up. The notion is the whipping up of a fury, an intrinsic element for life in the Proto-Indo-European conception. For to be alive is to be angry, we might say. Yet the same Proto-Indo-European particle also informs ancient Greek ormenos and ernos, terms used to refer to the growing shoots and stalks of green vegetation, life itself. There is also ancient Greek oros, mountain, again of the same Proto-Indo-European root which is of obvious general conceptual saliency for the Earth Mother and Mountain Queen Deific under consideration. Although perhaps more immediately interestingly for our purposes is another ancient Greek term that sounds similar, although in this case is etymologically unrelated. A case of convergent evolution, perhaps. Next section. The shooting goddess of order and growth the war effort of the natural world. The term, and indeed theonym in question, is hora, better known in its plural formation, hore, which is from the same root as modern English hour, year, etc. In Greek usage, this refers to a set of goddesses who both regulate the passing of the seasons and various elements of a righteous conduct. In both the natural and the human spheres. What is right is to be done at the right and particular time. It is no accident that these areas of responsibility are so strongly coterminous. After all, for the ancient Indo-European man, one was not separate from the natural world, but a part of it. And the natural world was very much an inextricable forest of laws and deeper order that ought and form the human inhabitants thereof as well. Something we have sadly lost in this detritus of modernity, where we increasingly feel ourselves to be not only above nature, but also above the gods, above divine law itself. Now this has further conceptual saliency when we consider the fertility rights for the land that must be carried out. It is part and parcel, may we say, of the wise stewardship of said land. We look after the land, the environment, nature, so that nature also looks after us. And those who refuse to embrace such a responsibility, or worse, uh, spit upon it and seek to exploit the land whilst offering precious nothing in return, may find themselves rendered down into fertilizer of another kind for same. This understanding is preserved in any number of archaic Indo-European sources. Although we have not heard much from the Nordic corpus in this piece, so we shall start with the incidents from the Inglinger saga. Of the death of Olaf, the tree feller. There were a great many people who fled the country of Sweden on account of King Ivar. And when they heard that King Olaf had got good lands in Vermeland, so great a number of came there to him that the land could not support them. Then there came dire times and famine, which they ascribed to their kings, as the Swedes used always to reckon good or bad crops for or against their kings. The Swedes took it amiss that Olaf was sparing in his sacrifices, and believed that dire times must proceed from this cause. 
The Swedes, therefore, gathered together troops, made an expedition against King Olaf, surrounded his house and burnt him in it, giving him to Odin as a sacrifice for good crops. This happened at the Vena Lake. Thus tells Theodolf of it. The temple wolf by the lake shores, the corpse of Olaf now devours, the clearer of the forests died at Odin's shrine by the lakeside. The glowing flames stripped to the skin the royal robes from the Swedes' king. Thus Olaf, famed in days of yore, vanished from earth at Verna's shore. Now it can be fairly argued, I think, that the understandings preserved there are twofold. First and foremost, that the king had neglected his duties of regulation in order to protect the environment, and therefore his people's ability to live thereupon. But second, that there are multiple spheres, multiple ways in which he could be said to have failed. One of these being the potentiality that he had done little to stop the massive increase in population beyond the land's carrying capacity, i.e. he had allowed through inaction things to get out of balance with the underlying environmental requirements of the deeper law. And the other being the allegation that he had not carried out appropriate sacrifices and other rights to ensure the charitable nourishing both of and by the land. Therefore they, his now suffering people, chose to offer him as a sacrifice instead. And entirely as we should expect, this is a sacrifice to Odin, the Indo-European sky father in Nordic form, to provide, as we had seen earlier, with the fire rites mentioned in the Veras and associated Brahmana commentaries, the fertility and abundance of the land once more. Another example, which beautifully illustrates this concept in action, concerns the Hindu figure of Shakambari, the bearer of shoots, or slightly more figuratively, the shooter. This is one of my favourite Hindu myths, because of just how much it succinctly illustrates. I shan't go into all the elaborate depth nor detail here, but the salient details are the following. A demon by the name of Durga Masur, the invincible demon, had secured a boon of erasing the knowledge of the Vedas, i.e. their performance, the proper pious conduct, from the minds of mankind. This led, as an obvious and direct consequence, to a cessation of sacral conduct by humanity, and the weakening of the gods, the ascendancy of demons and mighty demonic armies making ready to assail the heavens, as well as the immense degradation of the environment, nature, as a current result. All seemed lost, until Devi, who is above and beyond the universe in these regards, indeed is a priori to it, and therefore unaffected by the happenings therein that had so weakened the rest of the pantheon, she manifests as the demon army is making its way toward the final assault against the gates of heaven. She manifests as Shakambari, the bearer of the green shoots. Now usually we interpret the Saka in question, as referring to the green shoots of new vegetation that accompany the resurrection of the health of the natural environment with her arrival. And I do not think that this is inaccurate, but given her mechanism for dispatching the demon Durga Mathur, shooting him repeatedly with her arrows, I would also contend that the shoots in question may refer to those arrows, as, after all, there is a well-known crossover of conceptry even in modern English where we have the spears of asparagus or the blades of grass between the terms for growing consumable vegetation and sharp, piercing weaponry. The shoots of new growth, indeed. Life is thus restored to the earth, both through Shakambari's reintroduction of the knowledge of the rights to the minds of men. And it is interesting to note that the verses of the Queen of Serpents that we had earlier met, the ones accompanying the Verak rite aforementioned, are actually spoken and compiled for the Rishis, the uh, sages or seers, by the Queen of Serpents to begin with. The provision of fruits and vegetables be rendered up as sacral offerings to the gods there through, and also through Shakambari Durga and her army slaughtering their way through the forces of the demons, watering the world with the literal rivers of blood, of the foe that thus the result. That is how life is restored. 
Yet other than the aforementioned conceptual overlap for the shoots of new growth rising up out of the ground as snakes, or in the case of curly crops, snake men doing likewise, how does this relate to the serpentine form of the Indo-European Earth Mother? For that, we must turn to the Scythians, another shooting people, not least via the etymology of their ethnonym, and the various fascinated classical perspectives upon the Scythian dragon, Thracaina Scythia, hailed as Hora, and occasionally also referred to in subsequent literature as an or even the Echidna, a decidedly serpentine figure who is mother to their race. The Scythian Serpent Mother Per the accounts of several classical commentators, the origin of the Scythian race was to be found in the womb of a certain serpent. I shall not be getting into the details of this myth here, nor the comparative analysis of this in light of various other Indo-European origin mythologies. For that, I have dedicated an upcoming additional swathe of the Sons of the Sun series, looking specifically at the Scythian Sons. Because such a subject and its intricacies really does require quite an extensive exploration in order to make proper sense of it all, especially given the lack of primary text by the Scythians themselves in their own words as to what they actually believed upon this score, and the various efforts at affixing their mythos to other Indo-European canons that have been undertaken from time to time, including by those aforementioned classical authors themselves in the now far distant past. For now, it is enough to assume, for the sake of argument, that the Scythian dragon woman, occasionally thought of as Echidna, is an Earth Mother deific that, in conjunction with the Sky Father, and Valerius Flaccus is quite direct about this, Herodotus too, albeit with what he thought to be a differently identified mother, that she gives rise to the Scythian race of man, in much the same manner that the familiar Vedic account hails Vivasvan, the wide shining one, and Tharanyu, as parents to Manu, that is to say man, and further to presume that somewhere amidst the common coils of the several versions of the Scythian ethnogenesis, as presented by Herodotus et co., that there is this singular underlying theme which also expresses itself, again with some variance as to the details, in other Indo-European origin of the race legends, such as that of Romulus and Remus, Manus of the Northmen, etc. However, there are some complicating factors to the main transmission of the myth down to us through Herodotus. He was, after all, working through at least one layer, and quite possibly several, of intermediary conveyancing, and it seems likely that some details had shifted, due to their couriering and literal translation, as they made their way to him. One example for this concerns the alternate name for this mother to the Scythian race by Herodotus in his rendition of the Scythians' own origin myth, Boristhenes. Now the conventional wisdom is that Boristhenes is the daughter of Boristhenes, the latter being a rather prominent river of Scythia, the Dnieper, and as we shall soon see, the Danu root to this hydronym is not at all coincidental. Yet recent linguistic analysis has suggested rather strongly that Boristhenes, the name of both the river and the father of this river mother to the Scythians, is actually in its original Iranic tongue a female noun, one that the Greeks would have interpreted due to their grammar as being a male one. It would therefore seem plausible that this father figure, Boristhenes, was an unnecessary addition to the story by Herodotus or one of his intermediaries, an attempt to reconcile what should have been, by their view, a male figure for the river, with the clearly female identity of the river-linked female that produced the Scythians via Zeus. So in terms of a reconstruction of the original form of the Scythian myth, what we in fact have is the Sky Father in a relationship with the Earth Sorry, in a relationship with a river mother, or a water woman style figure. Something with clear precedency in an array of Indo-European mythological accounts, 
including the plausible etymology of Saranyu in Sanskrit, that being the mother of Manu by Vivasvan, which reflects a swift-flowing notion. And although, again, the genders do not align, the immense role of the Tiber in the promulgation and delivery to safety of Romulus and Remus in the Roman version of the same myth. However, that is not where the curious developments of the linguistics upon this reconstruction end, for the term Boristhenes has been decalked back to another pair of words in Aaronic, Warustana, wide standing, which might be interpreted to refer to a river or a great gulf of water. To my mind, however, it better recalls the concept of the wide earth, a prominent and well familiar way to refer to the earth mother, and for obvious good reason. Except how is it that a term that would otherwise appear to refer to the earth mother as, well, the earth, has wound up affixed to a river goddess? And why is it that I have no compunction in arguing that these are in fact the same being that is also referred to in decidedly serpentine terms in other classical accounts? Well, to address the first arc of this triforce, that of the earth mother and a river goddess, in the course of various of my previous works, we have earlier seen how Aditi is hailed as both Earth Mother and a celestial mother figure, and all mother of sorts to go with your father. In this latter role, the mother of the skies, it would seem logical for her to be closely identified with the waters that are the liminal sphere about the border of the universe. And indeed, there are various Vedic verses to this effect. Devi Vaksh in Arvi 10. 125, pointedly identifies her home as being in the waters, in the same line that she is singing of bringing forth the Father upon the summit of the world. However, it is also quite directly stated that these three elements, the waters, Aditi, and the earth, are one, a single mother, a mother to the gods, in Arvi 63.2. Sorry, Arvi 10.63.2. Ye who are born from the waters, and from Aditi, and from the earth, do ye listen here to my call. I would also submit that what we find recorded in the Celtic mythology, where the gods are spoken of as the Tuatha, or the tribe, D, gods, like Deva, Deus, Danan, expresses functionally similar conceptry. There the Danan in question is the mother of the gods, in a role quite akin to how Aditi is the mother of the Adichas, and this term is evidently intended to be understood rather more broadly than just the seven or eight, or in some cases twelve, solar deities. Arvi 1077 refers to the Marts in such a manner. There are also some fragmentary supports for this concept to be found in other Indo-European mythological canons. The mention made in Homer of the Okeanus, as a parent to Hera, for instance, or the Norse mythology having the initial generation of the gods being thawed out from the ice that is a strong functional correlate for the waters in these frosty northern climes. So who is this Danan? Presumably a similar figure to Danu. Indeed, the nominative for Danan is also Danu. Although I have kept the genitive form for the Celtic, Danan, in order to avoid confusion with the Vedic. This Danu is a wipe of Kashyapa in later Hindu concept three, just as Aditi is, and I would go so far as to suggest that in the archaic conception these would have been the same figure with different elemental associations, with Kashyapa being in the position in these later tellings of the Indo-European Sky Father. Handily, this may also assist to reconcile the unresolved questions around the potential co-identification of Danan and Anu in Celtic mythology, the later being Earth-associated, as Aditi also is, inter alia, and another mother of the gods. Per my schema, there is no contradiction in these accounts, just one goddess with two names and elemental or functional associations. So who is Danu? A term for a water goddess, from Proto-Indo-European Denu, that also occurs as a somewhat misunderstood figure in the Vedas. 
Fascinatingly, this Danu term is also a Scythian one, where, for the surprise of nobody by this point in the piece, it refers to a river. Indeed, the Dnieper, that river that is also labelled by Borestenes in Herodotus, has as its ultimate etymological origin precisely the Scythian and thence Proto-Indo-European term. There are quite a range of rivers, which bear Danu derived hydronymy, the Dniester, the Don, the Danube, and Achdanu, and still others besides. It would therefore be rather premature to presume that there was an especial linkage of the goddess to that particular Danu-derived river, although perhaps for the Scythian group in question, whose accounts were supplied to Herodotus, the Dnieper had a similar saliency to Father Tiber for the Romans, and they had indeed recongealed their otherwise pan-Indo-European, non-residual origin mythology to be aligned to this river specifically, as the localized embodiment of her. What does this mean? That this goddess is linked to, to the sky father Deific, this mother goddess bearing the name of a river, but also the earth, in the classical renderings of the Scythian's origin myth, has exactly the same name underlying that we ought to expect for the ultimate mother goddess of the Indo-Europeans, as attested in various other quite far-flung, all the way from India to Ireland, if not further, Indo-European mythologies. And that we can quite viably fill in the incredibly fragmentary characteristics and understandings of this Scythian figure that have come down to us by linking the goddess in question, now restored to her true status as a goddess, with those aforementioned parallel Indo-European expressions from elsewhere, especially the Vedas. This also helps to tie all together the conceptual association of this goddess with the waters, with the fertility, not only of herself in bringing forth the gods, or for that matter the first generation of man, whether Manu or Targetaus, or Romulus or Remus, born of Rhea Silva, that is to say, earth forest, to translate somewhat directly, they all come forth via this river. But with the land itself, we should perhaps say herself. After all, in the absence of the essential life-giving waters, few plants nor animals shall thrive, and it is precisely the coming of the rains from the sky above that brings up the shoots of new life in a not entirely incomparable manner to the rise of sharp pointy serpents from their holes in the wet, nurturing earth. However, there is a perhaps more direct reason for the comparison of this Danu Boristhenis figure that we should otherwise know as a water goddess with the creature that is the colossal serpent or dragon. Hence, assumedly, why Herodotus and Valerius Flaccus et co. reported upon this goddess as being such a sinuous serpent Time specimen. And that is due to the manner in which a river flows across a surface, which is rarely in a straight line unless the force of man or some other shaper is involved. Indeed, the course of the twists and curves of the river, the meanders in its flow, are almost akin, we might surmise, to the coiling thrust of the movement of the serpent. The river, in other words, is a serpent a life-giving serpent of waters, the quickness of life, Saranyu. Just exactly that which we have come to expect from our earlier conceptual syllabary around the Indo-European Queen of Serpents, Deific, co-identified with this mother of waters and mother of earth, and with all three understandings engendered in the fertilization and setting the conditions for the promulgation of life and abundance in the natural as well as human world. As applies Herodotus specifically, given that the account he gives, which posits a god and a demoness as being the progenitors of the Scythian race, this is apparently the tale told by the Greeks of the region about their wild and barbaric neighbours. It would seem feasible to surmise that this was not an authentic Scythian mytho-understanding, although evidently it most assuredly did share elements drawn from at least one, but rather 
the semi metaphorical cognizance of those Greeks who view the Scythians around them with a mixture of awe and fear, somewhere between men, and therefore in a certain sense related to them, and outsiders or demons. Legends so often tell us more about the tellers than they do about the subjects ostensibly being mythologized. Concluding remarks. The serpent protected protects. This has been quite a lengthy piece, and it has, as promised, coiled about itself in the wending, winding, winnowing way, as we have hopefully brought to light a whole scintillating suite of understandings that were otherwise left obscured neath the dusty earth and the seeming still, yet never quite stagnant, waters of the collective Indo-European mind. It is perhaps not hard to see why various of these perceptions may have fallen from the view over the ages. The serpent, much like nature herself, but then again I repeat myself, don't I, is not a creature that gives up her secrets easily, and is far more readily thought of as commanded by man than she is ever actually at our petty beck and call. Dangerous indeed is the presumption that we, not she, lies truly at the heart of this world. Nature is, as she ever was, well beyond our scope and ken of vision in much the same manner, and for exactly the same reason that a fish would be unable to describe the ocean. Or somebody might, to reference me some Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman, have some trouble seeing England while standing in Trafalgar Square. We are only a small part, and we are most assuredly not above, nor extricably outside, this incredibly complex environmental sphere, and we ignore that at our unabated peril. Mahadev himself may be able to don a cobra about his neck as an adornment under his aegis, or perhaps with reference to the Greek mythic concept tree as his agus. Yet for a man to carelessly endeavour to do likewise, with all the class of a trinket, could all too easily end up with the serpent playing the role of a noose, and not the identic one. No, for us and our lot, it is not to riskily attempt to command her, but rather to politely ask, and always, 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 to keep the appropriate sense of reverency and wonderment in our regard for her. As Merkia Aliade put it, as we have said before, for a religious man, nature is never only natural. Experience of a radically desacralized nature is a recent discovery. Moreover, it is an experience accessible only to a minority in modern societies, especially to scientists. For others, nature still exhibits a charm, a mystery, a majesty, in which it is possible to decipher traces of ancient religious values. No modern man, however irreligious, is entirely insensible to the charms of nature. We refer not only to the aesthetic, recreational, or hygienic values attributed to nature, but also to a confused and almost indefinable feeling in which, however, it is possible to recognize the memory of a debased religious experience. End quote. Beautiful stuff. But for us, we are not irreligious men. Quite the opposite. And so, therefore, we have no compunction in hailing our mother, the Indo-European Serpent Queen, that is, the rivers, the waters, the atmosphere, the rains, the heavens, the sun star light, the mountains, the earth, from whom we are ultimately descended, and to whom, like the serpent biting its tail, we ultimately return, with the sloughing of the skin, of the snake revealing, once again, new life for the next phase and cycle of creation's dance. Rather than impetuously commanding, we are more properly at her command, and we know that which it is that we must do. Nature, protected, protects. Tarpo Rakshati Rakshitaha. Thank you. Jai Matuddin.